we're just letting people in. We'll get started here in a second. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Joel Turner for co-hosting this. Joel takes care of a lot of the tasks in the back uh, that uh, keep uh, having a live workshop uh, a bit challenging. There's certainly plenty of these tasks. I'm going to wait another minute or so to get a few more people in. Um, excuse me one second here. I think I'm going to have to uh, do something here to make sure that my uh, screen is in control. Somebody is, uh, give me one second. So I'll, I'll pin you. I'll yeah. pin your screen. Too. All right. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Joel's uh, making sure my screen is, I forgot to uh, set that up a little bit early. So uh, if you're new here, uh, my name is Tim Seleski. Um, I was doing bi-weekly uh, workshops that are focused on people that are involved with digital woodworking tools. Uh, now I've uh, made it into once a month. And once a month gives me a little more time to kind of plan and work things out and, and kind of go from there. So behind me is, my, uh, is one of my CNC's back here. Um, for your information, it's a custom built CNC by a guy by the name of uh, Carl Bruce, who lives in uh, Bremerton, Washington. Uh, the project that I'm gonna do today, or that I'm gonna talk about today, is one that I had written an article about in the December 19th issue uh, excuse me, December 2019 issue of Popular Woodworking Magazine. Let me grab one here. So um, here's the cover and here's the article. There are a lot of tips in here in the article that I'm sure I cannot cover today. There's a lot of subtleties about assembling this kind of uh, furniture and I cover that in lots of details. Fortunately, Popular Woodworking has made that particular uh, article available online. So if you go to Popular Woodworking Magazine, search for my name, Tim Seleski, you'll see a list of the articles that I've worked on. Anyway, so the article is about a parametric bench. Let me show you what I have right here. All right. Okay. So uh, this bench is constructed entirely out of plywood other than uh, you can't really see the pieces down here. There's just some connecting pieces here that's made out of closet rod. The parametric aspect to it is that it's a design that can be modified and changed and scaled and do all kinds of things like that if you have CAD software. But this project, I went out of my way to make sure that this project, you're able to actually build this bench without a CNC. But since most everybody here uses a CNC or is interested in CNC, uh, we'll focus on that aspect in this workshop. I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways to pull it off without a CNC. So as you can see right here, this little section here I refer to as a rib, and the inside is a spine along here. And that spine actually determines the shape. So what we have is this huge collection of ribs. I think there's like 48 of them or 50, I can't remember right now. And uh, special ones on the ends that are sealed, but the ones inside have slots. So let me show you a little bit about the project here. Okay. Uh, well, this is the view actually here in Indianola right now. I have a camera about a mile from here and uh, it's a very sunny day. I hope it's really nice where you are at. Uh, if I'm making noise, that's because I'm moving this 50 pound bench somewhere else. So, sorry about that. Okay, now I'm back to it. So, um, anyway, um, this next slide here, let me uh, move on here. Give me a second here. Uh, for some reason, my, there it is. All right, sorry about that. I just transferred this file over. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the design of this kind of furniture, some of the ideas behind it, because the ideas can go into all kinds of areas in terms of furniture. You should be able to build benches and tables and potentially even chairs and other things as well uh, using these kind of techniques. And basically the idea is that you have a spine that determines shape and then you have uh, ribs that determine the overall look. 
So uh, let's see here. So here's an example of a workshop in 1914. For those of you that are Green and Green fans, this is John Hall's workshop. Uh, and it's a new workshop at the time. And the reason I put, show this here is that, uh, is that there's definitely a, a system process. At this time, the, the Hall brothers made a lot of boxes and they had jigs and fixtures and all the rest of that. Well, this parametric furniture that we're building is built on the idea that you have these very standardized things. So there is uh, the final bench uh, that I showed in popular woodworking. And I'll give you a couple of other views so you can see the details. So I'm not sure if my cursor shows up here, but you can see how the rounded ends here uh, bend in and out through here. And that's, again, all determined by the, um, the shape of the spine. And another view. And this whole project actually started when I was proposing a sculpture for, uh, let's say, a large mail order company in Seattle. You can see some of the proposal behind here. And uh, with that in mind, I actually tried to take the idea and simplify it and make it more useful for hobbyist woodworkers to build. So spine and rib construction, essentially, it consists of, I mentioned ribs and spines. So if you look at the effect here, this is the bench here on the lower left. And that shape was determined by pressing in the ribs along the sides here. You can see where it pushes in. Well, actually, in this case, I have them pulling out so it, show, it bows along uh, the center and then it contracts along the edge. But by equal, uh, by equal design, you could simply make the bench a curved bench by having a curved spine, or you can make it an S-shaped bench by having an S-spine, or you can make, say, two smaller benches. And that is all determined by the rib. And in this uh, illustration, you can see what's going on in terms of the ribs simply slide around the spine. And again, as I mentioned, they press in from the ends or pull in. There's another view, and there they are coming in. And the shape of the bench is determined by what you end up with. So spine design. Well, here's some examples here. I'm going to actually go back to a live view and show you how some of that works. OK. so. Back here, let me get this moved. So back here is some of the examples that I showed you in the article itself, and in, in the photographs and stuff. So if I press in with a rib, let's uh, grab one of these. If I press in with a rib or pull, whatever I've determined, I'm going to determine the shape. And as I move along, the rib, you can see that the curve will be followed because the spine sets the shape. And you could do all kinds of different shapes. No question about that. Uh, what I did find, and this is something to note, that is if the amplitude of the curve is too quick, it looks very abrupt when the ribs come out in this area over here. So this is too much. It really just made it a weird spiky bench. But if the amplitude of the waves is shorter, such as these small curves, these shorter curves, a little shorter curve here, it works out really well. So the first lesson in that is definitely be careful about the shape of the spine. I'm going to move in a little bit here and show you a little bit in terms of this model. So I have this little model here, and you can see that it's following the curve here. And that's all because I pressed in from the sides here. And so along here, you can see this little area along here where they overlap. That's very precisely parallel to the curve. So whatever you end up with, the spine is the determination for that. So uh, uh, I built a number of half scale models to, to kind of figure out details in terms of ribs. So there's a lot of things you can do in terms of rib construction. I'll get into that here in a second, but give you a general idea that uh, rib shape is what will determine the character of the piece that you're doing. So here's a simple C shape. And again, the rib is the determination of it. Here's a little more of a wiggle shape. I did find, uh, one of the things that I have found is, is you can easily make it very expensive for all the plywood to build this kind of bench if you have an inefficient shape that lays out on the plywood. Now, at the end of this, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of plywood layouts if you have a large enough CNC. But even if you have a small CNC, you've got to think about how much waste that you're going to have. At least it's a really good idea. 
So um, let me move back to my little slideshow here. Okay. So um, you can see this is the same bench here in the center that's shown in the center of the screen that you saw that bows out in the center. Uh, and then here it is with a curved spline in it. And there it is bowed out. And there I'm putting some of the last of the, of the ribs on. So rib design, as I mentioned, it that will determine the character of the bench in this case, or a table if you design it around that, yeah, around that approach. So um, I do have the plans uh, available uh, on uh, my website, woodworking.digital. There are free plans, don't worry about it. This is the basic shaping pattern. If you have a small CNC, you're likely to want out Run a, want to run out a pattern and then make all your ribs from that. The article gets into a lot of the details. So talk a little bit about construction here so you get an idea how it works. So I, uh, in the article, I showed a way that you could build this if you have, say, a small CNC, a handheld CNC like the Shaper Origin, or if you don't have a CNC, you simply make both the pattern as well as the shaping pattern. Two parts, that's all it takes is two parts that you have to make. And anyway, I figured out a, a process to shape upside down that makes this go well. I'm not gonna get into every detail, but essentially you uh, attach the pattern to the blank that you're cutting and then you actually route right into some sort of spoiler board that sits underneath. And uh, so there I am going through it. And again, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but you can see that I have screwed the pattern down through the blank part. And now the, uh, the router that I have that has a 5 8 inch bushing and a 3 8 inch bit is going around until it makes the entire part. And uh, here's what the plans are that are available at Popular Woodworking. And I mentioned before, of course, that the drawings are available on my website for free. So by CNC, um, you're, you're left with a situation to where you want to be efficient with your plywood. So with a 24 by 48 inch sheet layout, you're actually not terribly efficient. You get six out of a sheet. But if you go 32 by 48, all of a sudden, you're able to get eight out of a sheet. And um, I use what's referred to as nesting software. This is software that, that is set up to optimize parts out of a piece of, say, plywood and position everything to get the most useful cut. You have a bunch of variables you can put in, like how much distance from the edge and whether the wood needs to be parallel or it can be random and determination or rotation, all kinds of little details. And uh, in any case, this was as efficient as I can get. But as a result, the bench that you saw earlier, the full-size bench, you're able to actually produce that bench with two sheets of plywood. So uh, let me go a little farther here in ribs design. As I mentioned, you could do this with a shaper origin too. But if you have a small CNC, running out 48 parts out of, say, a Shapeoko XL, whose format is roughly 16 by 32, you, I think you can get two ribs. It would be a very long process. I personally have found that patterns and shaping in situations like that go faster than a small CNC. If you have a large CNC like back here, and I'll show you a few things here in a few seconds, uh, uh, then that's a whole different matter. You're able to simply run out a lot of parts quickly. So uh, lots and lots of parts, it's definitely lots and lots of parts. It's an unusual project in that there are so many parts. Uh, down in the tray below are these little spacers that I made out of closet rod that separates the legs, keep everything stiff at the bottom. And uh, by the way, uh, if you haven't already, turn on your chat function. If you have a question, just fire a question in there and I'll, I'll try to answer that. The article gets into a, a lot of details about pulling off the bench. One of the things you're gonna have to do is make a couple of special parts. You're gonna wanna make end parts. I don't know if you can see just below the top, there is one that does not have the slot go all the way through. It only goes partially through. You're gonna need that. You're also gonna have to I uh, have uh, uh, two parts that don't have screws through the bottom or the top edges because they'll show and you're gonna need that. And those are the parts you actually make first before you start screwing things down. And let's see here. So this is me cutting out those little discs from a closet rod, drilling a hole in the center, 
The first way to construct this, I'm gonna show you a little bit about construction here, is to build what I call as a backstop. Your best thing to do is, is make a stack of, I think it's five or six of these ribs and glue it together, clamp it down, let it dry. Once you do that, then all the rest of the construction goes a lot easier because the way to build this is to build it feet uh, up on a flat surface. So this is me, of course, you know, applying glue to the little discs that I use for separators and uh, aligning things because I have a hole drilled in there. I had it set up so that the hole diameter was just fine for using a chopstick to line up both the space as well as the rib. So the glue area is an important part of this, no matter how you build it. The area is in white, which is over here on the end of the stack that you see. And then the, the, the piece that's coming on is the latest rib. You only want to apply glue inside about, say, get come within a quarter of an inch of the edge. If glue oozes out, you will really regret it. It's almost impossible to get it out, out of there. Uh, so you want to be careful how you apply the glue and where you apply the glue. Again, the article will get into some more details. So here I am in the process of gluing it up. And notice the rib. If you look at the clamp, the orange clamp head there in the background, you can see that I pulled it tight against the spine. And that way my shape is consistent. You have to have that reference surface. In this case, it's pulling it against the spine. Now I get near the end. I need to cut off some of the end because you always build extras with the spine. So you got a little room to adjust things. And then at the end, I left a little stub. And then in essence, I use a trapped mortise and tenon uh, technique uh, in, in, in order to finish it. So there it is with all of the parts glued together, clamped up, left overnight. And uh, there are, you can see how it, out of order here. But anyway, that's the last part that goes on the cap. So, and that's how you end up with it. So I uh, got a few more things to cover, but anyway, the story again is available at poppywoodworking.com and the plans and the files at woodworking.digital. And let's go back to a live view. And uh, first, um, Chris Altwick said, I'm not sure what parametric means. So parametric is a term that's used in several different ways. Uh, in the CAD, can, uh, CAD and uh, CNC world. In the case of CAD, typically certain kinds of software focus on parametric functions. For example, Fusion 360, and I believe most of the Autodesk products do this, so it does SolidWorks. Rhino, which is the product that I prefer to use, does not take that approach, but they, you can get some of the effects through Grasshopper. Essentially, parametric and Feel free to correct me and look it up for the details. But essentially, parametric in this case uh, means that you are able to put in certain parameters about the, the components of the parts or the things that you're designing, and you're able to go back and to adjust them later in how they interact with the other parts. So in other words, I have a variable in there, if you can put it in programming terms. And if I change the variable, I could change some of the other effects. It's a dependency, a hierarchy, and all those things as well. And that can be very handy. Uh, in the case of parametric, in this case, I simply use it to indicate this type of construction and this kind of components that go in there. Parametric, in a sense, is actually live in this particular case. I could have built a bench with a big, huge curve. I could have built tables. I could build all kinds of stuff and use the same parts by varying the one variable, which is the spine. I know that's not uh, um, uh, you know, uh, precise, but uh, yeah, that should be enough. Are there any other questions before I get into the last little section here? Uh, Chris Altwig has come back with a very technical uh, explanation. I'll leave it to everybody to look that up because it's in context to CAD software uh, to where it makes the difference in this case. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go back to shared screen and um, okay. So uh, in terms of um, the, re well, actually that's the last of those slides. I'll talk about, I thought I had more, I guess I took some out this morning here. So I'll talk about some of the design things and the variables that you can put in. I already mentioned the samples here. So there are two key parts in this process. If you're gonna use some sort of router and, router and pattern approach, you need to make 
not just the, the actual parts themselves, these uh, um, uh, the uh, legs of sorts or spine and ribs, but you need to make a special part that is a little bit offset, a little bit narrower. And this is to allow you to use a router bushing and be able to end up with the same result. And so this is the shaping pattern. Just note that they're slightly different. This is definitely a little bit smaller here. If you look on the ends here, you can see that one of them there is a little bit smaller than the other. So you need to think of it in those terms, uh, uh, allow for a shaping pattern. Show you a couple of other patterns that we used in this. Now, it should your uh, should the um, should you end up building a bench if you decide to build a bench with uh, it has to have one direction. It can't go an S turn of some sort. It can be straight. It can't go in and out. But both sides have to be parallel. Should you do that, you also have the option to where you could build a curve suit, and that's pretty cool. You can actually have a curved seat. And as this thing expands out and curves around, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a little more of a comfortable place to sit. That's one option. Um, other shapes, I tried all kinds of shapes, came up with some fun ones that I decided that would ultimately just be, oh, like a, you know, some sort of table, something small that had, you know, really loud little uh, bumps out like this. This is very inefficient with plywood, so you have to think about it carefully about how much resources you want to put into it. And, uh, but <clears throat> you could build a great table and table legs using this technique. So a couple of weeks ago, or about a month ago, when I gave the class, <clears throat> I showed how to do, um, how to modify a design in three-dimensional form using a couple of CAD tricks. And uh, the, uh, the thing about those CAD tricks I showed you, I gave you one heck of a hint. If you have aspirations to be a furniture maker, I showed you a couple of ways to be able to apply shapes to surfaces. Well, what's available here, if you're a creative person, is the potential to build all kinds of stuff. You could build interesting chair legs that are stacks of plywood, either glued together or spaced out and then having some sort of shape behind them. There is a lot of creative potential here for people, a lot. Uh, so don't be shy about uh, jumping in and trying things. It's a, it's a very versatile technique and has a, a pretty big future in it. So I'm gonna ask, see if there's any other questions. It's awfully quiet today, no questions. Joel, you must have a question or two. You've been watching this for a while. Added, call out to Joel and see if he has. Oh, any. you're putting me on the spot here now. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Uh, so if so, you said that for people with smaller CNCs, like I have a Shape Oco Double XL, yes. that you would recommend rather printing out a pattern and routing rather than doing it on the CNC itself. Is that that's correct, right? Well, a Shape Oco XXL, I think you can get, I think you can get four of these components out at once. Okay. And, uh, so it, it may be on that line to where you can do it either way, but it's not just about the size of the platform that you're working from in terms of something like the Shape Hoko, Shape Yoko, Shape Hoko, excuse me. Uh, but it also has to do with the speed and how, how fast you can actually cut through the boards and stuff. Uh, a handheld two horsepower router with a three eighths inch bit can rip through a part pretty darn fast compared to a CNC with, uh, with a, um, a small trim router on the end that has to go a quarter of an inch at a time. It, it, it's gonna be a balance of some sort. Um, but if you had a smaller CNC, I mean, you could make this thing, I think with the 12 by 18 CNC, um, uh, that's part of it. So uh, it really has to do both with time in terms of on the CNC, but also efficient use of wood. If you lay all this stuff out on a piece of wood, let's say, that layout that I showed earlier, where I showed all the layout on the pieces of plywood, both a 24 and 32 inch wide pieces of plywood, efficient layout. If you use that as a guide, you could sit and go and lay all these things out, you know, pencil them out, and then rough cut them out with a jigsaw. And now your efficient use of the plywood, whereas you'd have to cut some 
pretty large square parts to cut out on your shape book of XXL, and you would find that it, uh, you would find that uh, uh, you may not be as efficient in terms of piece of uh, plywood. So, okay. Um, okay, a couple of questions here. I want to get back here a little bit here. They scroll through here. So what kind of bit do you recommend? It's feeds and speeds. Um, just like uh, the discussion with Joel Turner, it depends on your CNC, the, the power of the CNC itself, its ability to move you know, through its XY motions, XYZ motions, <clears throat> as well as the router or the spindle that's on there. So when I cut these kind of parts, I tend to cut to be efficient. <coughs> Pardon me. I actually have cut these parts out with a 3 8 inch bit. But then again, excuse me, I had to get a cough drop. <clears throat> then again, I have a three horsepower water cooled spindle. If I was using a small CNC, I'd be using a quarter inch bit. Um, excuse me one second. So on this CNC, <clears throat> I'll cut this plywood at about 120 inches per minute, pretty fast. And I'll take off typically first cut, I will use what's called a compression bit, which is meant to pull the fibers up on the tip of the bit and the rest of the bit, it pushes the fibers down. So the idea is to keep things from tearing out as you're making a plywood cut. So I will make my first cut uh, over 0.25 inches. I typically go in 0.26 or 0.28 or 0.3 or whatever. That way the top surface of the wood is not torn I get a very nice clean edge. You can see this, this is unsanded, just a nice clean edge. And then I'll make my other passes and then I'll end up on the bottom and then I'll use bridges or tabs to keep attached to the plywood. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, another one, if you built a chair, would it have gaps between the legs like, like a traditional chair? Would it have legs all along like the benches? There's a lot of ways to do this. I actually, uh, did go through a couple of chair designs using these techniques. I can imagine that it's a combination of things. For example, you could have legs that were say three, say three wide on this, okay? And then they would extend out as if this was a chair here, here's the bottom and go up and you have the back like that and it would, spend, uh, it would be three wide. But there's no reason to extend the legs down here in the center to fill it up. You could make that a solid stack of plywood. You might be able to work in a hardwood or some sort, or have a hardwood sit on top and, and balance, uh, have mortise and tenon to attach down below. There's a lot of possibilities there with that kind of design. So I think there's re it's really pretty open in terms of what you can do. All right, a uh, smaller router would be great for making patterns. Uh, indeed, indeed. You don't actually have to have a CNC to build this at all. However, this is a superb example of what a CNC is good for. The two primary things that CNC does well is precision and the other is repeatability. In other words, one part is identical to the next part. And if you have a fixed CNC like this, unlike say a shape or origin like this or any of the other ones you likely have, you can make the part while you're off doing something else. So you get efficiency on top of that. So, um, uh, let's see, uh, Jenny and Tom uh, asked a question here. Uh, is my view correct? The edge of the spine is square, yet the slot is round. Why not make the two shapes the same? Reasonable question. Um, well, I kind of have a designer's answer. It may not be what you like to hear. Let me see if I have one of those round parts. Yeah, I do have a couple of spaces down here. So, you could certainly make the fill the same shape. I'm just taking the bottom here. Drop that one. Okay. You could certainly make the fill the same shape. No question about it. But what I chose to do as a designer is I put a complementary shape in here. Instead of having this part try to match up to that, which is going to become challenging in terms of blending all the rest of that. So what a designer approach to things when you have problems like that, sometimes is to take the contrast and the basic form of the shape and turn it into an asset. So this round shape simply complements, you know, the, the shape out here. But, you know, obviously that's a subjective choice. That's a subjective choice. Uh, why not make the two shapes the same? Um, there's lots of possibilities, there's lots of things out there. So I mentioned glue squeeze out 
any fixed tricks. Uh, there's a lot of fixed tricks to glue squeeze out. I'll talk about them in just one second. But on this project, because it's edge green, edge of plywood, you do not want to have to go in and clean up the glue. Uh, the uh, pieces, let me see if I, I don't have one of the finished parts out there. But typically, you're going to want to either round over or put a slight little chamfer on these edges because if you're sitting on this as a bench, you can't go along and feel in between here and have a sharp edge. That's not good. So having some sort of consistent uh, kind of edge here really helps. And the thing is, is if you're glued together and you have some squeeze out coming up, you can't get in there and clean it up. Now back to a general answer in terms of squeeze out. I mean, there's masking off areas, but you can't really do it in this area, uh, in this project. Um, but there's also, um, I typically will let the glue slightly dry so it's a little bit elastic. Then I'll get in there with some sort of carbide scraper and then I'll pull it and just basically peel it off. Uh, the first approach that a lot of people do is to wipe on, uh, you know, use clean rags and wipe water in order to, in essence, glue the PVA, the uh, polyvinyl acetate uh, base glue, yellow glue is what I'm using. But that will raise grain on the edges of the plywood. In fact, it'll raise it a lot. So you really want to avoid squeeze out. My solution to this project, as I mentioned, is to avoid putting glue more than say a quarter of an inch. Keep it a quarter inch away from any edge, which is unusual. If you're worried about not enough glue, let's put it this way. I went through a whole pint of glue to assemble the bench you saw. There's so much glue surface, flat and flat. You don't have to worry about anything ever coming loose. So it'll stay together. Just avoid glue, squeeze out. Uh, somebody put in a link to a popular woodworking article that I mentioned. Let's see, can you come, uh, can you cover some of your favorite holding fixtures on CNC? Well, let's see, I don't know if we have a lot of time. I will give a slight introduction. I could do a whole class for sure on nothing but holding because holding with uh, a CNC router, particularly uh, when you're, you're cutting wood is as uh, some unique and, and pretty big challenges. Let me clear off a few things here. I'm going to bring in something to show you what I do. So spine and rib construction, there's a future there. And by the way, if anybody has actually built this project, bring it, you know, let me know. I have not heard that from any readers that built the project, but it would be interesting to see and hear what people have done. I'm going to grab something that's sitting on the ground behind me. Okay. I wasn't prepared for a big show of this, but I'll give you an idea. So one of the things that I've gotten very comfortable with is the idea of clamping something down or holding it down. As mentioned in some of my earlier, uh, you know, live stream uh, workshops, uh, I've actually designed the bed of my CNC to assist me in both positioning and holding parts. That helps a huge amount. I can actually register plates down onto the bed. If you look at the bottom of this, there's a couple of holes here. Uh, they'll actually register onto my bed and therefore they will not move laterally if I just put a little clamp to hold them down. That is the first step. But the second thing that I found out is I prefer clamps to be made out of wood. Now there's all kinds of materials and there's reasons for different kinds of clamps. You know, metal clamps are going to be stronger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do not like to hit metal with a CNC bit, even if it is aluminum. I'm not happy about that. I'd rather have a sacrificial sacrificial wood clamp. These little clamps are ones that I make, uh, I call them bird clamps, and I make them different lengths and different sizes. And they're able to, uh, you know, hold a stack here like this, or a short little run with a little overhang, a little bit like this, and they'll tilt down, and they rest on the bed on one edge. They work that way. And I make them in batches. Essentially, I uh, use this fixture here to make them. I'll show you this. So I have this fixture I designed. So down here, I hold in a blank, and then this is designed to hold in position where the scene, where the uh, plan that I have, uh, that where I do this, it comes in and it drills out the slot. The slot here, you see at the bottom here, uh, for the T-bolt to go through. 
Then I take that and move it up here and it cuts the profile. That's the overall shape. The profile of the contour depending on your program and it cuts that out of the blank. Pick it up, move on. So uh, with this, I can make clamps pretty quickly. And what I do is over a small period of time, I, I just sort of accumulate that kind of scrap around, cut it to that size. When I have a pretty good stack, when I've destroyed these kind of things long enough, then I just make another batch and it works out really good. And I've showed this in, in my actual live, the, back in the good old days, I've showed it in classes that I've taught uh, to all my students. They all, uh, they all want to learn how to make clamps that way. Speaking of classes, I want to mention, um, before I mentioned that I was, and I still am, going to do a hall table class. So if you look at the last two workshops, and those are available on YouTube, I show how to build a hall table using uh, CNC and CAD and CAM and all kinds of stuff along those lines. And I also show you a little bit how to style it and, and to um, modify the design. That was a big emphasis at the end of uh, the first episode, showed you how to take it, my base 2D design and approach uh, ideas to modify it and change it yourself. In the next class, I showed how to do it in 3D. So the uh, class that I have in mind is probably going to be five sessions, of about an hour each. It'll also include an interview with each student and uh, uh, ahead of time so we get an idea of where you are. I'm going to limit the class to four to five people because this will be an interactive class. You'll have homework, you'll do stuff, we'll interact in the class, four to five people. I'm gonna do it sometime in August. I'll make an announcement in the next week or so. Also gonna do a beginner's class. Some people just feel they need to have some serious help. Uh, you know, whatever it is, we get together four or five beginners. I will have a list of topics that we'll cover, uh, but you'll probably have a whole lot of uh, questions and suggestions of your own beginner's class. And then um, I used to do uh, occasional one-on-one -on -one classes in my shop, weekend classes, uh, always restricted to two students. Now with the COVID issue, that's not really practical, but I will do one-on-one -on -one workshops where over a period of say a month or two months or several personal one-on-one -on -one sessions, we'll cover all your questions and help you get started, help you advance, help you move on and show you a lot of techniques that I, uh, uh, that I, uh, um, haven't covered. So are there any other last minute questions? I'm starting to run out of uh, questions that I see on the screen. Um, doesn't seem like it. All right, well, uh, next workshop, let's see what date do I have? It'll be Sunday. Yeah, I may have the date wrong. I think it's Sunday, August 15th. That workshop, I'm going to do something that I um, <clears throat> typically when I do live classes, week long classes, uh, typically, I cover this at some point, but I'm going to do a class in design. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, this is a more of a lecture thing, but uh, it's a it's a this topic I've covered a lot uh, in in all kinds of different uh, parts of my career, both as a graphic designer and all kinds of things. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to talk about design as it affects furniture design uh, or some other thing that you're designing using woodworking tools. If you find yourself uh, where you have something you want me to cover, just go ahead and send me an email. Let's see, Kevin, uh, let's see, August 5th is Saturday. Okay, well, I'm glad that got corrected. It's August 16th, which is Sunday. I wanna write that down. Okay, August 16th. All right, so uh, if there's no more questions, um, I, th I think we're gonna probably close it down a little bit early today. Now, I have to tell you, I, I, I was a little, awkward about doing this particular workshop because it covered a topic I've written about, but there was a whole lot of stuff that I just could not cover in a print article. I wanted to do this in person. I thought it would be helpful. So hopefully today's workshop has been good for you. And uh, if you want to get the plans and you want to get the DXF files and everything to make this, you can go to my website, woodworking.digital. I have a special version that I've done for people that are owners of the Shaper Origin. And that is available on the Shaper Origins community site. And all the differences between that and a regular CNC's version, it's all been worked out. So you can use the Shaper Origin to either make the individual uh, ribs or you can use the, uh, or patterns or both. If you want to sit all day and do this, that's fine. Uh, so uh, that's available uh, online. Anyway, I appreciate everybody's um, attending today. 
And uh, I, it's a beautiful day here. You can see out uh, my back door here in my shop. Uh, it's really nice. I've got to get out and mow the lawn and enjoy the day. I hope you do the same. And remember, stay safe, play smart, be very careful out there. This is not, um, this is not a what if thing. We're all potentially vulnerable, so be careful. All the best to you, and we'll see you a bit. Well, hopefully we'll see you next month. If you have any questions, you're interested in those workshops I mentioned, email me. I'll get you on a list. Uh, I'll correspond with you a little bit. Once we get a, uh, you know, four or five people together, then we'll try to set a date and see about woodwork, uh, doing these workshops at a convenient time. We'll, we'll have a common either evening or a Saturday or something where we'll have these sort of joint Zoom meetings with four or five people. And they will be interactive. Larger workshops like this, we can't really do too much of that. Thank you very much, and everybody have a wonderful day. Goodbye.